It is very nearly Halloween, the time of year to celebrate all things spooky and scary, and an apposite time to ask, why do we enjoy horror? In the philosophy of art, there's something called the paradox of horror, and it goes like this. People enjoy horror. Horror movies, scary games, creepypasta, whatever. But horror contains depictions of things that would normally revolt and revile us, like violence or monsters. You can also substitute horror for tragedy. I would not enjoy watching two teenagers kill themselves, but I have been known to enjoy Romeo and Juliet, which contains a depiction of that same thing. So how can we get pleasure from depictions of things that would normally be very displeasurable? The obvious response is that it's something to do with knowing that the horror or the tragedy isn't real. We know that Dracula doesn't really exist. We know that the actor playing Romeo isn't really dead. We know that the scary picture is just a picture. That's not a real bear. Don't, don't be scared. It's okay. But that will only explain part of it. That might explain why we don't find horror as horrible as we would if it were real but it doesn't explain why we actually take pleasure in it. David Hume said that we get pleasure from seeing horrible things happen as part of a well-structured narrative. We take pleasure by looking at the skillful way in which the horror is presented as part of the story. But not all horror happens within a story. What about a haunted house or just a scary picture of a ghost? What Hume has done is he's explained why people enjoy stories generally. He hasn't explained why we enjoy horror per se, or dissolved the apparent paradox. Noel Carroll also talks about horror, as you'll know if you've seen PBS Idea Channel's recent video on his five types of monsters. Carroll says that horror features mysteries and questions like what is Dracula hiding? What's causing the bumps in the night? What is Ash not telling Ripley? Our curiosity is piqued by horror and when these questions are answered and our curiosity is satisfied we experience pleasure and monsters are especially good at arousing that curiosity because they're weird and they're strange and just by existing they pose the question what the heck is that? Carol says that the displeasure of horror is the price we pay for having our curiosity aroused and then satisfied. He says that we do actually get displeasure from seeing depictions of horrible things. It's just that we are compensated for it by other pleasures. But, like grisly ghouls arising from graves, some problems appear for Noel Carroll. Beris Gort points out that satisfying curiosity isn't really a very good explanation of why we find horror pleasurable, because you could criticise a horror film on the grounds that it's not scary enough. For instance, if at the end of Paranormal Activity it turned out that all the activity was just totally explained by normal things, yeah, the noises that was plumbing was broken and then the, the footprints that was just neighbour kids are pulling pranks, well that would actually answer all of the questions. It would satisfy your curiosity but it would be a crap ending because it's not very scary. Consider also that horror can be cliché or predictable, or you can re-watch a horror film and still enjoy it, even though you know the answers to the questions and so your curiosity won't be stimulated anymore. For instance, I know what happens at the end of Romeo and Juliet. I know who The Thing is disguised as in The Thing, but I can still enjoy watching those. Gort says that Carol's compensation idea with curiosity isn't really on the money. It's not that we are compensated for the displeasure of horror by other things, we actually do enjoy the horror, we take positive pleasure from it. It's a thrill, like skydiving. He says that our response to horror can be split into the cognitive part and the phenomenological part. The cognitive part of the response is your evaluation of the object of the experience. For instance, my evaluation of the thing from the thing is that it's bad and if it was real I don't want to be anywhere near it. But the phenomenological part is the feeling itself. When we have a negative cognitive evaluation, we usually have a negative phenomenological response, but not always. When we watch a horror film, for example, we negatively evaluate the monster or whatever it is, but we still enjoy the excitement of the feeling. 
Gort doesn't just take on Carol, he also has a swing at Aristotle. Aristotle said that tragedy and horror allow us to express negative emotions and purge ourselves of them. And that might look like an appealing idea when we remember that a lot of famous horror monsters were modelled on real-world fears. Dracula was about the fear of sexual liberation, the Daleks were deliberately supposed to mirror fear of the Nazis, Godzilla was about fear of nuclear weapons. Maybe those monsters and horror allows us to express those negative emotions and those fears in a more socially acceptable way. And maybe that's true to a certain extent. But it would be weird if that's the only reason we enjoy horror, because often that purging is incomplete. For instance, the xenomorph in Alien was designed to represent fear of sexual assault, and that is still a scary prospect even once you've seen the film and supposedly purged that negative feeling. I think Rick's car engine from Rick and Morty Season 2 is an excellent representation of global capitalism, and that can still be quite an intimidating institution even once you've seen that episode. So there might still be a bit of a mystery here. Gort said that we can enjoy what we negatively evaluate, but why do we enjoy horror? What is it about it that we find pleasurable? What do you guys think? Why do we enjoy horror? Why do you enjoy it? Next time, we could either talk about hedonism, or we could do scientific naturalism and God. So leave me a comment telling me which one you'd like to see next. And if you want to be a pal and you want to help me out, please do subscribe. This episode was sponsored by Audible.com. If you go to audibletrial.com slash philosophytube, then you can get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of their audiobook service that you can cancel at any time. And also, every time one of you signs up, I get a tiny bit of money, which I really appreciate. Last time we asked, who should Superman save, morally speaking? So let's have a look at some comments. We were discussing the idea that Superman spends time as Clark Kent, and while he's doing that, people are dying that he could save, so maybe he's morally obliged to give that up in order to go and save more people. And a lot of commenters said that, well, maybe Superman is physically very tough or invincible, but mentally and emotionally, he could be just as fragile as the rest of us. He was raised in a fairly typical human setting, so there's no reason to believe that he would be immune to burnout or ennui or, or even uh, mental illness. Maybe he could get depressed, or maybe Superman is already giving his all, and if he were to give any more, he would encounter emotional and mental limits. And, and that's a really interesting idea, that the Man of Steel could be, in that aspect, just as vulnerable as the rest of us. Loads of people suggested this. It was by far and away the most popular comment. Most comments were just versions of this. And it made me realise how, how much I think the Superman films have to catch up. Because there were some great comments here and, and we could write a Superman film and it would be awesome. There's so much philosophical detail you could go into that just never gets talked about because we just have to keep going over the same old Superman is Jesus metaphor again and again and again. I'm just bored of it. So the comments were really, really good this time. Well done to all of you. Barnabas Maximum Music suggested that if Superman gave up his life as Clark Kent and did it publicly, if he came out and said, hey everybody, I've been living among you for years, I am now giving that up in order to save people, then he could actually end up inspiring more people. If he's supposed to be this inspiration to humanity, then maybe he could still be obliged to save more people and encourage other people to sacrifice more. And that's a really, really interesting idea. Maybe that's the direction they're going to go with now in the comics, now that his secret identity is out of the bag, apparently. Marcy Eleveno said that being obliged to help people could present problems. We were talking about the ideas of Peter Singer, who's a philosopher who said that you should give until you reach the point of marginal utility. That's the point at which if you were to give any more, you would hurt yourself more than you would help anybody else. And this commenter said that, well, how can we ever know where the point of marginal utility is? How can you know precisely where that is, and, and therefore how much you should be giving? And yeah, that is a criticism that has been put to Singer, and there could be a grey area there. But as with all grey areas, there will be clear zones either side of it. You might not know exactly where the point of marginal utility is, but if you're very affluent, you know that you're a long way off it, and so you know that you could still be doing more. So Singer's ideas could still be practically useful and morally informative, even if we don't know exactly where that point is. 
Nada de Cat said that Superman could be an extension of colonialist ideas of the white saviour, and yeah, I certainly think that is an angle that you, you could come at that from. I think it could be more explicit, maybe, or, or at least in the Superman media I've consumed, but yeah, that's that's definitely a point worth making and, and worth having. Representation really does matter, and it's, it's important that we acknowledge how some of the things that we hold dear have maybe grown organically from older things that we wouldn't think were so hot anymore. Uh, comics aren't really my bag, so maybe if you went over to uh, NerdSync, the people I collaborated with last time, they might be able to tell you more about that, or you might be able to have a more informative discussion about that. But yeah, very insightful, com a very insightful comment, thank you. That's all the time we've got this week, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Ah!